today we all live in a world, every human being on the planet has to cope with technological change. And this is not new. Already from the stone axe to the steam engine to the latest smartphone, we've been living with technology since the very first day that we are human. Yet despite our intimate relationship with technology, we know so little about how it actually seeps into our lives. We're basically moving from gadget to gadget and we're sleepwalking into our technological future. I'm here today to make an attempt to bring some understanding in this regard. I will present a model called the Pyramid of Technology, which shows how technology becomes nature in seven steps and what inventors, engineers, scientists and designers and also entrepreneurs can learn from this. But first, allow me to ask you one basic question. Who here in the audience ever had the dream that you were able to fly like a bird? Okay, so that's amazing. That's, that's, this is more than 50% of the people that have this dream. That's amazing. I will get back to this later, but first I have to explain my model, the pyramid of technology. You know? So it was inspired by this famous Maslow pyramid of human needs. In 1943, Abraham Maslow presented his hierarchy of human needs, and he said people have different needs from f food, safety, security, to social belonging, to self-realization. And according to Maslow, every lower need had to be fulfilled before you could move on to a higher level. So a schizophrenic tramp would be at the bottom stage of physical needs, whereas most of us are somewhere in the middle, and the nurse that helps the tramp is perhaps at a, lower, a higher stage. So if we would try to make a, a similar model for technology, a pyramid of technology, what would it look like? And also if we would assume that every lower level would have to be obtained before we can move on to a higher level, then what would be the lowest level? Well, certainly this has to be the envision stage. Every new idea, before it can become operational or accepted in our society, there has to be this dream, idea or vision. That's where all the technology starts. So an example of a technology that's currently at this level is the quantum computing. Some scientists are working on it and it might be part of our lives one day, but this isn't necessarily the case, because there are also examples of other technologies, like for instance the time machine, which has been envisioned for centuries, yet I've not yet seen a working prototype. More than any other stage, this envisioned level is the realm of the dreamers, the poets and the science fiction writers. And often it's also underestim underestimated by more practically oriented people. However, it is in fact the bird chamber of all new technology. One example, um, the communication satellite. It was envisioned by Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer, in 1945. And it took over one decade before the first satellite was actually launched into orbit, effectively also lifting this technology onto an operational level, the second level. At an operational stage, a working prototype exists. So for instance, today, lab-grown meat, growing meat by taking only a few cells from the animal without having to slaughter the whole animal, currently resides at this level. Last year, the first lab-grown hamburger was presented. And some scientists believe in the future it will be this sustainable, animal-friendly alternative to raising cows, pigs, and chicken. However, much more funding and research is required before lab-grown meat can ever rise onto the pyramid. If ever, because this isn't always the case. And it would definitely not be the first time that the technology is, is stalled at this operational level because the perspective of being applied and hence making money is just too flimsy for investors. At an applied level, well, technology becomes available and affordable. And there are many technologies that are also stalled at this level, sometimes for economical reasons. Think solar panels. They exist for decades, but for a very long time they were just not cost-effective enough to be widely applied. 
Some other technologies are stalled for more fundamental reasons, like nuclear energy, which is being applied in many countries. However, it's never truly accepted because of the yeah, moral objections against the nuclear waste and the risk of nuclear disasters. And this also shows that technology don't rise and fall in isolation on the pyramid, but always in a context of other technologies competing for our acceptance. And while many technologies have great difficulty of reaching the acceptance level, some new innovations just do it, do it in only a few years, like the smartphone. Other examples of technologies that are now at an accepted level are cars, um, televisions, and GPS systems. And for me personally, I'm, I'm this kind of person, I, I cannot read maps anymore. I, I, I need my GPS to navigate the, uh, the city. So for me, and this is pers personal and cultural, the GPS is already at a vital level. It's hard to live without. Technologies at a vital level are the ones, the technologies that if you would remove them from society, it would cause a lifestyle changing crisis. So for instance, sewage systems. We don't think about it that often because yeah, they're just there and they were invented and introduced some centuries ago. But just imagine we would now remove all sewage systems for, from all major cities. That would be a big mess, <laughs> I'm sure. And also some technologies which are much newer, like the internet. It only exists for a few decades, but if we would remove it from our society now, that would be also an interesting situation. And yeah, I think you could have a nice discussion on whether you rather live without sewage or without the internet. <laughs> I leave that up to you to decide. Although in some countries, in the, well, on the global population, there are now more people with access to mobile phones than clean drinking water. So that, that's interesting. It's, it's not that obvious always. So two more stages to go. And you know what happens with really successful technologies is that they, they become invisible. We don't recognize them as technology anymore. And a good example here is the alphabet. Really, the alphabet is in fact an ancient information technology that allowed us to make our thoughts and voices permanent in the physical space. Not only books, newspapers, magazines, digital displays, signage, billboards, even graffiti uses the alphabet to convey information. And while as a young child you, you need to spend a lot of time mastering the alphabet, once you can do it, you immediately forget about it. Also, the clock is an example of an invisible technology. It allows us to uh, measure time with more precision than the natural units of the day, the month, and the year. So we can make meetings with great precision. But I think we also all know this feeling in the morning that your alarm clock rings a little bit too early. And then you have the situation where the technology is not really serving you, but you also start to serve the technology. You're being domesticated in a way by this technology. And especially when a technology becomes invisible, this is not only very powerful, but could also be risky. So we should also be very keen on which technologies we actually allow upon this invisible level. And then the final summit. So what's the ultimate thing a technology can do. Well, I think it's very clear what's at the summit. The ultimate thing a technology can realize is to become naturalized or indistinguishable from nature. And some obvious examples are clothing. For us, it's just natural that we wear clothes. And I guess there was, uh, at the time, not yet a Nobel Prize for the genius ancestor who came up with the idea of using an animal skin as a coat but he or she would have definitely deserved it. Another example is agriculture. You cannot imagine living in a big city without having agriculture. We humans, we do agriculture. It's something we do, it's, it's normal, it's natural. But 10,000 years ago, agriculture was a big technological revolution. 
No longer we were living the hunting, gathering life on the savanna. No, we settled down, started planting crops, wait for them to grow, and then harvest them, which not only completely changed our way of life, but it was also a radical intervention in the natural environment at that time. And one more example, which is even older, is its cooking technology. I, I don't mean the barbecue per se. To, today, when we put a piece of meat on the barbecue, we say, oh, it's going back to nature. But really, some hundred thousand years ago, cooking was a revolutionary new invention. For the first time, we started pre-digesting our food before the eating. We extended our stomach in the outer world. And by pre-digesting the food, we were able to intake more calories in less time, which allowed us to grow bigger brains, socialize more, and basically become the human, humans we are today. So if we look at the, the whole pyramid, then you realize that technology always starts out as something artificial, then it can become familiar. Uh, when it's really successful, it becomes like a second nature. And if it's truly victorious, it becomes this first nature. And this learns us also that we should not see nature and technology as separate things, like black and white but rather with our technologies, we are always transforming nature into a next nature as evolution goes on. Also on a more practical level, we can learn some things from the pyramid. For instance, if you think you are an innovator, you could ask yourself, at what level of the pyramid am I the most active? So let's go to the stages one more time and see what professions are active at what stages. Well, the envisioned level, that's certainly the level of the dreamers, the poets, the science fiction writers, and the visionaries. People like Jules Verne, who envisioned the submarine. At the operational level, we see more principal scientists. People like Nikola Tesla, who one century ago already made prototypes of wireless electricity. At the applied level, we see the engineering entrepreneurs. People like Thomas Edison, who was half inventor, half businessman. At the accepted level, we see a lot of activity from designers, user experts, marketeers, and I think Steve Jobs is really an example of someone who's done great things at this level. He did not invent the MP3 standard, and the Sony Walkman already existed for decades, yet he combined these two existing technologies in, in the utterly acceptable and also utterly successful iPod and later, of course, in the iPhone and the iPad. <laughs> then at the vital level, I had some difficulties of finding, well, an, a technology person that really focuses on this level. But maybe politician like Barack Obama actually operates on the vital level with its attempt to make healthcare into a basic human right, while at the same time trying to get rid of the idea that a gun is a vital accessory for every American. Also at the invisible level, I had some difficulty finding people, maybe teachers who teach children how to read and write, and nowadays also digital skills. And similar at the naturalized level, who's working there? Maybe parents who teach children that they should not uh, run around naked and wear some clothes. But still, these people who call themselves technology innovators, you hardly ever see them on the top levels. Because typically, when we think or talk about technology, we're always talking about these lower four levels. And yeah, that's, that's limiting. So like the fish who don't know it's wet, we are swimming in our technological environment, unaware. Most people have a basic definition of technology as anything that was invented after you were born. Or even worse, um, technology is anything that doesn't quite work yet. And these limited this, the, uh, definitions, as a result, we, we settle for partial solutions. So we dream of things like telepathy, and then we settle for a mobile phone with an empty battery. 
50% of the audience here dreams of being able to fly like a bird, yet we settle for a crowded airport. If only we could take our technologies full cycle to the top of the pyramid, we could do so much better and realize the dreams we have of ourselves. And then no longer technology is this artificial, alien, unnatural force, but rather it will be the celebrated materialization in the world of our human thinking and imagination. And no, I'm not saying it will be easy, but if we decide to push our technologies to the top, then at least we will know where we are going. And this is not back to, but rather forward to nature.